On today's episode of The Resilience Project, I speak to Andrew Lindsay, MBE. Andrew won a gold medal in the year 2000 as part of the Team GB rowing team, but having only really started training seriously for it a couple of years before, but then literally never getting in a boat again after the victory. It's a fascinating listen with loads of great resilience lessons from overcoming imposter syndrome, nearly quitting before he achieved the gold medal but turning his attitude around, making what seemed to be very strange career choices in his business life, and the mindset he uses to keep focused on his goals, avoiding outside distractions, whether it's the opinions of others, the news or social media, plus his simple mantras for life to try and keep focused on moving forwards every day. Welcome to this episode of The Resilience Project, chatting with Andrew Lindsay. Okay, so it's the year 2000 in Sydney, Olympic final, the rowing eight, and you, as part of Team GB, beat Australia in their own backyard. When did you realise you were going to win it? I think we, we were so focused that we were going to get out of the blocks, get ahead, stay ahead, and never let go, that when after literally 30 strokes, we were a length ahead of the Australians. We were like, you know, it wasn't like we'd done it, but the, we, we are well on the way to, to beating the Aussies. Um, and, they're, and they're the favourites, as it were. So, so, so that's a good situation. Like, you haven't won it until you cross that line. Yeah. Um, and they came back bloody fast at the end. But, but absolutely, you're, um, we got a massive leg up from getting a, get, delivering on our strategy to get out of the box as fast as you can. And the Aussies didn't get out of the block as fast as they could, and we were suddenly a long way ahead of them yeah. very, very early on. And so during that race, I'm sure the Australian crowd are on your side. <laughs> What's going through your head? It, it, what's interesting in rowing is that, is that it's very much, um, you, there isn't any pressure from crowds and things until the last 500. Yeah. And we got to the last 500, a length up on the Aussies, been knackered. <laughs> we'd, we'd gone out, uh, you know, gone out as hard as you can and, and, you, and, you, and, and then hold on. So the last 500, last quarter of the race, you're holding on. The crowd are starting to shout, and then the Aussies started coming back at us. And my God, the pressure then was was massive because it was a case of not letting them row through us. Yeah. Um, and everything they could smell, they could win now. The 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 um the 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 crowd all cheering them on, obviously. Um, and that's probably the moment at which we felt most isolated was was right in that final bit. We we done. We set ourselves up, but we could still screw it up. Yeah. Hold on in there. Yeah. But a very, very pressurized moment. In fact, I remember us that one of our guys called a crab, which is you know when you like miss the water, and that just does not happen in an Olympic final. You know? <laughs> You're not, it doesn't happen to an Olympic winning crew. Yeah. And he missed the water, and this is about 300 meters to go because the pressure was just so Whoa. intense then. And is there anyone in there that's telling him to keep going at that point, or? Trying to pick the, you up. The cox. So the cox is um, has definitely at that point shifted into, you know, <laughs> what we're all thinking. But actually, we are. That's probably the last thing I can remember about the race was that like catch a crab wobble and then the cox going just calm it, calm it. We've got this, guys. Calm it. Um, and then it all you, it went black. You know, you can't really remember because you're just you're just holding on, holding on, holding on. But you can't. Um, there's no, none of us are talking. You can't talk. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you're physically unable to talk. And so what point do you then remember? Do you remember crossing the line? or? I don't know whether I can remember crossing the line. I, can rem- I, 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 I think I can remember throwing my arms back and doing the whole <laughs> lying back thing. And I didn't, but I don't know whether that's as a result of the videos that I've seen yeah. or not. Um, I can remember getting to, to floating around afterwards having won and the, you want to get your feet in out of the water your feet get very very sore or my yeah. feet are very fat they get very <laughs> sore in those little shoes so you want them out into the cold water so you're sitting there with your legs straddling the boat but but you can't um you can't i could i remember not being able to stand up i couldn't do anything you're too i was too tired and it's not that that was the case after every race um but you would have thought after winning your dream race, you'd be, yeah. you'd be up and whooping, but there was no whooping for quite yeah. a long time. So you call it a dream, winning a dream race. 
for how many years had you been dreaming of that moment? How long had you thought that this is even going to possibly happen? So my, my original sort of um, moment of going, this is when I wanted, this is what I want to do, was, was watching um, the Olympics in 1992 in Barcelona. And Pinson and Bregory have won their gold medal, everyone expected them to. Um, and they were sort of the, the schoolboy pinups. Pinson yeah. was, was a young guy, Bregory was the older guy, and they were just amazing. And they, they were shoe ins to win, and win they did. And then the, these, these other, um, these two brothers, the Searle brothers, Johnny mm. and Greg Searle, um, and their cox, Gary Herbert, then won very unexpectedly and, and won in an incredible style and sort of by, by, I mean, proper, proper last minute, keeping going, keeping going, keeping going, pressurising the opposition and then winning on the last stroke. Amazing race. Um, and that was a proper, that's what I want to do. Mm. So that was eight years previously. And so had you, how long had you been rowing for at that point? Couple of years, really. So, I mean, I was at school, so I was probably that was fifteen. I probably started when I was thirteen. So, yeah, a couple of years. At what point did so you looked at that and thought, "This is what I want to do." But at what point did you then start taking that seriously and turning that into, "Okay, <laughs> I need to do something to achieve this thing." Well, it's amazing because because there was a gang of us in that in my year group who all felt the same inspiration from that that Summer Olympics in Barcelona, and and we all had. You know these guys pinned on our walls in, in our in our dorms at school, going, "This is this is this is our goal," mm. and we all corralled around that. Um, you know, we had a we had a, a uh, if we wanted to do a big push in the race, it was the Searle brother drive. You know, <laughs> was it, we were absolutely obsessed by these by these sort of heroes um, as a group, and and that you know, if I just decided on my own without that sort of camaraderie and team spirit of other people trying to do it, it would have been a a dream yeah um as it was it became a reality and we started winning we, we were a very close-knit focused team of, yeah. of guys aged 15 and we won our you know our national schools regatta and we went on and did this and and, and the snowball sort of picked, picked, picked up pace it's an amazing mindset really because i think of uh like when paul gascoigne scored for england against scotland sorry um and you know seeing gary lineker score in 86 and all those other things you think oh yeah i want to do that in the world cup and then, of course, you go back to school and forget about it. But that wasn't the case for you. But I, th I think I think that's the thing of of of, of a team. You know, I, I've mm. always been amazed. You know, in rowing, there were single scholars. Like, how do you do that? You look at tennis players. How do you how do you have the focus? And when you had a bad day, who keeps you back on track? Mm. In in a in a team sport, and rowing is, I would say, probably the ultimate team sport. You cannot perform if one of your team players is down. I always think in in football or rugby or something, that you, you can still perform if one person has a bad day. Mm. You can't in rowing. It's, it's a proper, proper, you're fully dependent on one another um, for, 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 the, for the performance. And, and there's no way that I would have gone to the Olympics as a single scholar. I mm. wouldn't have had the, the, the sort of, um, I don't know whether it's, whether it's the resilience, but you, the, the, the resilience I find came from, from the team sport and, mm. and everyone leaning in. So when you're having a bad day, they pick them up. When they're having a bad day, you pick them up. And, and that's how you keep together on your goal. So if you think about the people that you did see go through singularly, what was different about them? What, what, <laughs> what can you identify? They were different. They were, they were different. Mm. You know, they, they, they were... Um, they were sort of loners, funny enough. You know, we we were absolutely there was. You've got to enjoy what you do mm. if, if you want to do it. If do it to sort of at a high level, and suddenly in a in a in the sporting arena, you know, the camaraderie of you. If you ask me what I miss most about about, about rowing and being a sportsman, fitness and camaraderie, yeah, as well as the sort of competition. But but the um, I think that the guys who do it on their own mm. are incredibly. They're incredibly self-motivated. They're incredibly mm. um, focused, much more narrowly focused on the goal, yeah. and probably have rely less on the on the um, enjoyment of doing something as a collective, which which was a very very important part of it for me. And for you, though, in your teens, you were training. You were getting up at wasn't it like four o'clock in the morning or something like that? It's a great myth about rowing. Everyone gets a oh, professional row. They all get up at, <laughs> at crack of dawn and row. The reality was that when uh, at university, yeah. all of the the college crews would get up really early and all match each other out about who'd get there <laughs> earlier. 
and then we'd go later on and go rowing a different, you know, this was a more sensible time. So we were never, yeah, relative to rugby and football players, yes, you, got, you had a morning session and an afternoon session, and morning was, was, was first thing, but it wasn't the 5.30, getting, well, I never, I've never rowed in the dark. You know, everyone who's, oh, pe- people do row in the dark. Yeah. Um, with lights on their boots. I've never, ever rowed in the dark. I really thought you did. I've always had this admiration for this, like, getting up at stupid times for you. Yeah, but that's I think I've lost of, a bit. That's of... part of the myth, isn't yeah. it? That everyone, everyone <laughs> creates a, 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 an impression that you, you work incredibly hard. You do work hard. Yeah. But, but actually, I would say it goes to working sensibly and well rather mm. than working. You know, if you're rowing in the dark, you can't see what you're doing. You're mm. probably not actually <laughs> progressing your technique. If you do it in the daylight when you're a bit more awake, you're more likely to, you know, you're, you're, you're training cleverly rather than just training hard. So you, when you're doing that kind of training, which I guess was hard, did you enjoy it or were you thinking this is crap? <laughs> no, I absolutely loved it. I, I, I mean, you, obviously you, you, you're, you go into a land, land training was never my cup of tea. So weight training and sitting in a gym on a rowing machine, that, I, that wasn't fun. I remember once going to a, an altitude training camp in Spain in, in the Olympic year down in Sierra Nevada. You're in a, in a ski resort in winter and everyone else is going skiing and you go off to the gym <laughs> and do three sessions a day of weights and, and rowing machine. It's like, this is just ridiculous. This is mm. not fun at all. But actually getting out on the water, it, you're, you're, you're really focused on making progress. You don't just go and row without a focus. You mm. row, that's what you do on the land, on, on a rowing machine. But on, a, on, the, on the water, you're rowing with focus to make it more efficient, to make it faster, to, to bond the crew together into, into the machine it needs to be to win. And that was always endless incremental improvements, yeah. um, which, I, which I did enjoy. And that's probably quite a key thing, incremental improvements. Is it not true that in any discipline, in any walk of life right now, people are looking for instant success, whereas you were okay with a little bit each day? Yeah, I, th- I think, I think your, your rowing certainly is not a sport. In fact, I don't think many sports are sports mm. where, you, where the, you get the sort of the sudden breakthrough. Um, it's, it's all about incremental improvements. And that was a great big thing in British cycling in the, in, when we were rowing, actually. British cycling was just becoming exciting and Chris Hoy mm. was leading mm. the, the, um, the sort of British Olympic cycling team back then. And it was all about these small margins and incremental wins. But I'm a big believer in perseverance. Perseverance does the trick. Just persevere, keep pushing at it, keep pushing at it, and you'll get to where you want to get to. Try and do a, a giant leapfrog and mm. you're, you're skipping out a whole load of necessary things you've got to learn on the way mm. and a lot of the hard graft. Mm. And so when you were going through that and making those incremental changes, which can be frustrating as well, because obviously naturally we all want to be further forward, was there always a point that you saw Olympic final, Olympic gold, or was this just I'm going to get to be as good as I can be? No, the, 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 I, you know, it's, I can fairly and honestly say I set my, my sort of dream on going to the Olympics. It wasn't actually, it was never Olympic gold. Mm. It was going to the Olympics, um, age 15 in 1992. But I, I can't fairly say that every day when I went rowing, I had in the back of my mind the Olympics. Mm. That, that's nonsense. You're, you have in the back of your mind winning the next race, beating the guy in the next boat to you, you know, getting to the getting selected for a crew, whatever it is that your your focus is on. Yeah. Um and actually I would say that my I had a big sort of um whatever you call it, early days fantasy, more than the goal of going to the Olympics, mm. age fifteen, sixteen. Completely forgot about it all. Mm. And then at the next Olympics in nineteen ninety six um, when it was in Atlanta and, and we won, the Pinson Rego had won again, but no one else won anything. We got a bronze medal in the four. I was like, oh God, yeah, I, I remember I wanted to go to the Olympics. <laughs> oh. you know, um, and, then, and then sort of disappeared again back into university rowing. And it was only in, in 1998 actually that I sort of got back into thinking actually this was a, with two years to go, mm. I'm, I'm, I want to go and try and get selected in, into the crew. Mm. And so do you, do you think when you hear people, sports people or business people or whatever, who say, yeah, I always knew I was going to, is that, is that easy to say after the time? Or do you really come across people you I, think that? I think in the broad it's bollocks. Um, <laughs> but, you know, people have a, a kernel of, of drive that they want to achieve something. And whether it's, you know, absolutely, I would have said, um, 
you know, I, I, age 15, I wanted to go to the Olympics or if, if I hadn't won the Olympics. But, it's, but, but then the story changes to meet the facts. And you go, yeah, I've always wanted to win a gold medal. <laughs> well, you know, the, <laughs> no, the reality is you're, you're driven by something and that is what make, puts you on this journey to pursue uh, mm. the goal. But I'm totally honest about the fact that I didn't. I I never ever thought I was going to win a gold medal until mm. in front of until we got into that final year and we started winning races. Yeah. And I was like, well, actually, we have a chance. Albeit there were these Americans who we who we didn't know about, and it was only really I would say um, this bizarre fact. But when we lost the heat, that I knew we could win the gold medal because okay. because we lost our heat, but we should have won it. So we knew we could beat the Aussies on a good day. And the Americans had been beaten by the Croatians, who we had, we knew we could beat. Mm. And so suddenly we're like, actually, we could really win this, rather than we want to perform as well as we can with an expectation we'll probably be able to get a silver medal. Mm. Suddenly we were like, we can win this. But I I, I look at people who have I always wanted to <laughs> own an airline, Richard Branson. Yes, nonsense. <laughs> he came into that world, yeah, yeah. and 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 that was the logical next thing to do. I always wanted to set up. Tesla. I knew, mm -hmm. you know, when he was running PayPal, you didn't think he was going to set up Tesla. Mm. I didn't believe. Mm. I have memories of, I'm not trying to compare my very, very, very low key sporting career to yours, but when I was refereeing, suddenly going from, I remember being in the tunnel to do my first ever live Sky game, and it dawned on me how the hell. Have I got, like, do they realize that I'm not good enough for this? Like, and I had this 30 seconds, I don't know, it seemed to be ages, which probably in a few seconds of like, this is ridiculous. I, I, I'm an interloper, I shouldn't be here. Do you ever have those kind of imposter? Imposter syndrome stuff, yeah. I, I think most, um, most obviously on that was, was, um, was, was in the first boat race that I wrote, the Oxford Cambridge boat race. Um, and, you know, you're, I was, 19 or just 20 and you're down on the tideway in London and there's helicopters flying around <laughs> and there's police escorts and there's the media sticking things in your face to talk to, to interview you this Steve whatever he's called used to do you know the uh, BBC Sport Ryder Steve Ryder yeah. <laughs> and you sit there and you go I, I shouldn't be here I, this is this is wrong this is all wrong and 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 the pressure that that put on us all but, yeah. uh, but on me I remember it very clearly and and you're totally distracted from what you're there to do yeah. and and it was a massive learning because you go okay you know control the controllables i can't i can't i i've got to learn i'm here to focus on winning this race mm. not for the jolly or to allow myself to get distracted by all this other stuff but mm. i it was such an exciting adventure but absolutely i didn't feel i should be there mm. when it came to the olympics no I, by that stage no I, I sort of um i'm here and i'm here to win and I'm, yeah and, I'm, and we had our what we used to very long focus throughout the year on the, on putting up bullshit fo filters yeah. to make sure that you know none of that stuff happens. All that matters is 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 um mm. is performing as well as you can today. Do you think it would have been harder if it was today with social media and everybody selfie in and you know the temptation to do a photo? Look at look at me and send it to parents and I I. Yeah, as, a, as a case in point, we, 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 we were very, very clear that there was no room for that kind of mm. um, what I would call nonsense and distracted, distraction in, in our crew. And I think we've been, you know, and, and the example of that was that we didn't, we elected not to go to the opening ceremony. You mm. know, we said we, we, the, the opening ceremony for a lot of people is the epitome of going to the Olympics. Yeah. It's the big thing. You march, you know, for your country through the thing. You're on display everywhere in the world. <laughs> Um, and we said we're not going to go to that because it, it's it's not going to help us win. So I think we were sufficiently focused and cohesive as a team to to, to um, I think that would have been the case today. Hmm. But it's um, I think we were very very uh, we benefited hugely from a sort of rain shadow effect of Redgrave was trying to get his fifth gold medal. Right. So all the media attention was on him, and hmm. actually nobody gave a crap about us and that was fantastic <laughs> yeah, we yeah. sat and we and then and then when we won the day after they did everyone was like surprise gold medal we we're like well hang on a sec <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. but we quite like that because um because we were we, we, we had been totally shipping out. nobody ever cast and uh, you know they come up to the training camp up in mm -hmm. brisbane beforehand and interview the four and red grave and all the rest of it 
And we'd just be going, you know, who are these guys and what are they doing? You know, <laughs> no questions. Really, really good place to be. Yeah, yeah. And so do you think that, I mean, well, I know the story from one of your colleagues, Ben Hunt Davis, about you getting in that squad partially because of his say so versus his best friend. <laughs> that, is that, that true or I, is that? Um, the, I, I think that there was a, there was definitely questioning. There was a, there was a sort of in the tent and out of the tent, and there were three of us out of the tent mm. going for two places mm. um, at the final two places, and those who had already been sort of selected informally mm. um, were definitely asked for views mm. on on who was going to who who they wanted in the crew. Yeah. Um, because we were all much for muchness in terms of the three of us that were out there, I think were, were much for muchness in terms of um, performance, mm. physical performance. So, so there was a degree of that. But it's um, yeah, there was an absolute ruthless, and there's a countless examples in, in any crew or mm. any sporting team that, that wins of um, making hard decisions in the pursuit of your, of your, of, of your goal. I, are they hard decisions? I don't know whether they are Hodgins. They're just they're, they're choices. They're, they're they're totally rational choices yeah. without emotion in the pursuit of of, of a very focused mm. goal. But I mean, ultimately, he had to choose between. He was given a chance to choose between you and his best buddy, and he chose you, which must have been hard. Which 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 was either hard or totally logical in yeah. if he believed that that was how he was going to achieve his goal mm. um, most effectively. And so I think that, that, that it's very easy to let those kind of emotional things get in the way. Yeah. If you are slightly cold and calculating about what you're trying to do and you shed the emotion, actually it's quite easy to make decisions, but, mm. but we get stuck by mm. making by, through emotion. Mm -hmm. when, um, when you were going through all of that, was there any moments where you were like completely down on yourself, down on your luck, feeling shit, thinking, oh, I just want to go home. Plenty. I mean, <laughs> I mean, en endless. You yeah. know, the, the, um, I can tell you actually, right, in, in January 2000, so just after the millennium and all mm. those parties and mm. the, you know, all that stuff, um, we, I had had, I'd gone home to train. I wasn't in the squad. I was, I was on the periphery of the squad and I was trying to break into the squad to then be really eligible for selection. Um, and they'd all been off to a training camp in Australia to go and see the rowing league and all this kind of stuff that, uh, before Christmas. And I was trying to get selected, to, trying, to, trying to break in. And I had um, trained by myself throughout December. I'd gone home for this, for the millennium sort of celebrations <laughs> and sat in the corner drinking, you know, fizzy water. Um, and then had come back to, 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 a, to a selection camp in, or is it just a day down in the Dockland, London docks. And we did all these, all of these wannabe people trying to break in. And we raced and I, and I, and I, and it went really badly and I mm. felt it going really badly. Um, and we got to the end and the results were printed out because you don't actually know the results. It, it's sort of, you swap around, swap people around, 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 around. And I came top and I was like, that is, that is bizarre. That's really <laughs> weird because I know that I didn't race well and I wasn't comfortable um, with, with the result. But I, but I went home going, you know, whatever. And then the next day the mistake was found and the numbers were reprinted oh. and, I was, and I was bottom. Oh, wow. And, I, and it was a proper sort of, um, oh, yeah, stuff this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to chase something and I'm not good enough to chase. And, I'm, yeah, and, I'm yeah. like, and actually my... A combination of my parents, my, my mother in particular, and my brother um, gave me the, the, the talking to saying, yeah. "Come on, yeah. don't don't throw it away. You put you put enough work into this to not throw it away yet. Wait until you're dropped rather than mm. dropping yourself." Mm. Um, and as it was, things then picked up from there. Mm. But mm. but it but it um, yeah, definitely down down on down on on, on, on the <laughs> lowest rung of the ladder. And on the subject of being dropped. There was a story about you and a girlfriend. <laughs> well, that was at the same time. <laughs> that was all going south. I mean, things were, you know, you're, it's really interesting. Things can weigh up against you and, and you know, a bad result on, on, on that racing day. Your private life, your you know, girlfriend, you know, intimating that she wasn't very interested in you anymore, felt like <laughs> the end of the world at the time. Um, you know, all of your, 
your peers who you were at that stage at university with, they're all off in getting jobs and mm-hmm. they're mm-hmm. earning money and they're excited and I'm going rowing every day and not getting anywhere, wondering what 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 bad, cool, what have I done? Yeah. Um, and, and you just get weighed down by that and you get despondent and mm. then you lose sight of what your goal is. And it, however strong your uh, ambition and desire to go to those Olympics are, it feels like I, un, untouchable. Everything's against you and you just... You know. <laughs> and, and then either, you know, either you've got the resilience to get through that or you lean on other people to, mm. to give you that resilience. Um, and, and, and that's exactly what happened. You know, the people that counted, the people that mattered and who were close to me were like, no, no, come on, hold on to that, keep that flame burning. Don't, yeah. don't, don't, don't let these things get on top of you. So what did your mum say? <laughs> on, on the, uh, well, the, the, I, I was there crying into my pint pot about the fact that I was, I had lost this race or this selection race. Um, and my girlfriend was, was um was was in the process of disentangling herself from me um <laughs> in a not terribly subtle fashion and um and my mother said you're going to say so your 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 grandmother lost two husbands mm. um had a son um and she is living by herself has been living by herself for 20 years um get a grip mm. you mm. know you're wor- you're throwing away this massive opportunity because some um, Girlfriend of yours who you've been seeing for eighteen months is yeah. leaving you, yeah. um, and and you're you've totally lost perspective. Get get a grip, man <laughs> up. And that was a uh, a very useful bit of maternal advice. <laughs> and you've got kids yourself now, yep. so what do you say to your kids to help them have the mindset to understand that there's peaks and troughs and failures sometimes along the way. I think it's 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 really difficult, and 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 children are all they're all different. Four boys, they're all they're all very different. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're very s- firm as parents that that they're not people who can achieve anything they want to achieve. They just put their mind to it. I think that's a, a wrong philosophy. Um, I think you can achieve. You know, I could never have won the hundred meter finals. So mm-hmm. don't try and pretend to me that I could win the hundred meter finals. I'm, I'm, I, I can't. Um, you've got to find your your niche and your metier, and then and then and then focus in there. But you know, aim high at things that you want to aim high at, and 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 do the very best you can, and don't give up. Mm. But 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 do the very best that you can with the gifts that you've been given, mm. um, and don't expect things to fall in your lap because they won't. Yeah, it's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> but you, whatever it is, you anything worth winning or achieving um, it requires work mm. if you don't put the effort in and you win you don't actually get the reward the, the yeah. fulfillment from it so it's it's the there is a, there is a definite equation between the amount of effort you put in and achieving something and the reward that you mm. get from it is mm. is, a, is a sort of ethos that I firmly feel true oh hello uh, sorry to interrupt look it's just a quick favor If you're enjoying this, which I guess you are if you're still listening, can you make sure you leave a review? That's all. Now, back to the podcast. So if you could go back in time and tell yourself one thing, what would it be? I I don't know. I I, I have this dilemma which which, um, where I sit there and I go, I wish I'd lived a bit more at university mm. but I know if I'd lived a bit more at university I wouldn't have achieved my my um, mm. my, 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 my Olympic sort of goal um, and on balance I wouldn't have changed that but but I do the, the sort of the dark side and the fun side of, <laughs> of student life yeah. which I definitely totally missed out on is something that I, I, I look back on with some regret. Mm. Um, so what was the biggest thing you had to overcome whether it's for the Olympics or subsequently in your kind of business career, what's the biggest thing you've had to overcome that's actually surprised you, that you didn't think would be a problem? That's an interesting question because I, I thought you, you definitely get, um, the, your imposter syndrome thing is interesting, and, and, but, but I, I sort of got over that quite, mm. quite soon because you realise that it's not, you're not going to become the, um, sitting at the Olympic final by chance without having done a lot of work together. Mm. You're not going to become a chief detective of a business if you haven't actually earned your spurs. You don't suddenly pop there, pop mm. up there. Um, 
So, so I, 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 if I don't think it's that, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. Um, I mean, what's the hardest thing? I think getting, getting, getting the balance right, making sure that you're enjoying what you're doing. You don't yeah. lose sight of it. You know, there was an interesting learning I had from my sporting thing, which was by far and away the most enjoyable year of my sporting career was was age 16 when I was newly infused with this excitement of like trying to go to the Olympics. It wasn't that serious. Mm. If, if I lost a race, I would say, right, let's go win the next one. Mm. Um, and we were, and it was all new. And by the time it came to maybe jaundice by having lost three boat races, but going to the Olympic year, you know, the stakes were high. There was a financial, a, a very small, but there was mm. a financial impact of, of, of um, if you got dropped, you, that was the end of your income. Mm. You know, your the, it, it was all a bit serious, and the enjoyment therefore was less. Yeah, um, doesn't detract from the huge satisfaction I got from winning, but the you've got to enjoy what you do, yeah. and I think enjoying what you do requires you to keep pushing boundaries and learning new things and having new experiences. Mm. Um, and 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 I. I and not just getting stuck in the rut and doing the same thing again and again mm. and again. I think that that that's something that I, I've definitely learned that you need to keep changing, bringing the changes, or else you get you get bored, you get mm. stale, and then you end up not performing well. So Redgrave won his fifth gold medal. Then you won your first, and only. Yep. I mean, one's quite good. Let's be fair, but it was your only one. You didn't want to go back after that? But I think that goes to the point. I knew that I was at the end of my road on road. Right. You know, I, I, I sat at the start of that final going, this is my last opportunity mm. to, to go out with a bang because when I, in 2,000 metres time, it's over. Mm. And that was very empowering, mm. actually hugely empowering, to, to, to sit there and feel, this, this is, this, I can put every last ounce of this and, have, and make sure I have no regrets. And that was a, there isn't another... Um, this isn't the practice for the mm. final. This is the final. And but if there's a learning there, I think, I think I, I've definitely gone through life feeling that it's always a practice, mm. kind of with bringing up children. Mm. You know, this is a practice, practice. And you suddenly realize they're, they're growing up, they're in their te- to getting into their teenage now. And you suddenly realize, I'm never going to have an infant again. Yeah. And, and carpe diem, grab it, mm. you know, and, 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 and um, it's not a practice. Mm. It, mm. Every, every day is a day wasted if it's wasted. Yeah. So make the most of it. But it's very easy, and you must have seen this in your sport. I certainly saw it in football and refereeing. People, people who won't let go. It's like they had one good year or 10 good years or one great moment, and then they always want to be around that environment. They always want to still be there with the blazer on or doing well, this. You're a big cheese and you're a big cheese in a small pond or whatever the yeah. word, a big fish in a small pond. But uh, how did you say, no, 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 I've done that now, move on? I think the reality was that I knew that it wasn't a career for me. I knew yeah. I, needed to, I, I needed to financially and you know, for the rest of life, I wanted to go and get, get, have a business career. Hmm. Um, and, and sport, I met, I met um, Frank Warren once, who's the boxing, yeah, yeah. The boxing promoter. And, and I remember him, he, and he was very interesting. He was talking about, um, it's all about money. Everything was about money, mm, mm. Uh, and and he was and he came, introduced me to this concept which I'd never come across, which is the Corinthian values, which you know you're, you're, you you perform to win rather than perform for for money or anything, and and I I absolutely rode to win mm. and rode for the joy of rowing um, to be with people because I enjoyed it. Mm. I didn't row to, to to make money or anything. That was a separate thing. So that was a in many ways my rowing career was a was a luxury that I was able to indulge myself in before I had to get into the real business of, mm. of, of, of making a living. Mm. Um, I never saw it as a, as a career. Mm. And, for, <laughs> and I know that from my, my CV, it was only after a, 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 you know, a few years after finishing that actually I, my CV, um, I, I put my rowing under my career <laughs> rather than above my career as sort of university, sport, and then career, and I sort of well, actually you know somebody suggested I re- reposition it. That she's that that Olympic thing was part of my career, which I yeah. never thought of it like that. Okay, was there a moment in the days or even hours afterwards where you were like, "Oh, it's over," and people weren't, you know, like they were now focusing on the next Olympics or whatever, and you weren't part of that? 
did that feel not, weird? Not on, I mean, the next morning, I would wake up the next morning going, my life is empty and devoid of any reason. <laughs> I guess I wake up with like, ah, well, I'm late for training. And then you're like, no, I'm not. And it's all over and I'm never going to train again. Yeah. And that was, that was disconcerting, mm. um, but very quickly filled with other things. And that was fun because the, the post, the second week of the Olympics, rowing is a wonderful sport, ends in the first week. So you have the whole second week to, to go and have fun. Um, so that, that filled the gap very nicely. But um, no, funny enough, I felt that more when I changed career, mm. when I left the world of banking and I went to, 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 into small business. And all the peer group that I left behind in banking um, then went on a sort of surge as that world did really well in 2005, six, seven, And I had gone off to do something different. Mm. And, and that was hard work. And you mm. felt that you had made a bad call and left something that was um you, you were suddenly no longer part of something that was there mm. i had no regrets at all and i've never had any regrets about stopping rowing yeah um i did have temporary regrets when i was earning peanuts in my small business and watching my my banker friends still yeah. still um riding the wave but actually it was absolutely the right call to have made but didn't you have a situation where you left banking and then you ended up working effectively on a shop front for less than your secretary had been earning yep. when you were in banking. Absolutely. She, she, she came in and told me as much. <laughs> um, no, I, I said there, was a, there was a shop, one of our shops, I went to work for a small light bulb business, one of the shops was literally over the road from the Goldman Sachs offices. And I remember um, Robin coming to see me and, and laughing at buying <laughs> a light bulb from the person who she had worked for um, for the last couple of years. But, that, um, but those those are important lessons. You know mm. what what what's actually important. It, it's not that it isn't money that's important. It's fulfilment. It's mm. it's it's enjoyment. It's achievement. It's progress. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, and and that was a step back, to take a massive step forwards, and and with hindsight, definitely the right thing to have done. So at that point, were you already thinking, I want to end up as a chief exec? No, um, I wanted to learn about real business mm. rather than these, this enormous banking world. And I learned very quickly about real business and loved it. Mm. Um, and I always wanted, I never wanted to be a banker. I always wanted to be in, in running businesses. Um, so, so, you know, and I, and I never, I thought if I never had the, uh, that North Star that maybe the going to the Olympics was, mm. I, I just wanted to work in business enjoy what I did and make sure it was growing and mm. you know, growth is a massively important part of, of my motivation on, on business. So I guess from that you definitely took that it's okay to take a big step back in order to take a big step forward eventually. Yeah I, and, and you've got it you've got it you know, going back to those 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 um, people who like to wear the blazer and who don't want to get out of their little their 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 little pond um, the the I, I'm a strong believer that that, 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 st that stimulus comes from a changed environment. You've got to mm. keep changing, bringing the changes. If you, if you end up just going down the same, commuting to the same place every day to work for mm. you know, the, old, the old sort of 1950s, 1960s job for life thing is mm. a sort of prison sentence to me. Mm. You've, mm. you've got to bring the change. You've got to try new things. Um, and, and at some point, you, you, I'm sure you settle down. But... but um, no, pastors are new is, 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 is what keep, keeps you interested. Mm -hmm. And then, was it 2007, you got into, you became part of Utility Warehouse? Yeah, so, so, I, so I left, finished rowing, top of the world, analyst at Goldman Sachs, bottom of the world, <laughs> three years, went to BE to sell light bulbs, um, ended up doing a management buyout of, the, of that business, um, and then ran that with a partner um, which was which was fantastic but um, got approached to, to join utility warehouse and that was sort of like what I wanted to do I wanted to step up into a slightly bigger business yeah. it was slightly more established but still had this big growth opportunity ahead of it um, and and joined back in 2007 yeah. yeah but I mean since you've been involved with that business obviously you didn't start as chief exec you ended up becoming chief exec and the growth has been incredible. What lessons would you say you'd have taken from rowing and winning <laughs> at that level into the business here? So, so the, the, it's, it's, 
the utility bus hasn't been a um, hasn't been a straightforward ride. It's mm. it's you know, and actually, I don't think any businesses. Everyone mm. who says our oh, businesses just grow and grow and grow, mm. you know, th- th- it's a massive sort of roller coaster, um, sneaky path to, mm. to, to um to to in the pursuit of progress or or or, or growth, um, and that whole. You, know, you Rome wasn't built in a day. You've got to persevere, and you've got to show show um, consistency in where you're headed, mm-hmm. as, and, and know where you're trying to get to, which has always been growth, um, confidence in what you're doing, and that you're doing it in the right way, but be totally open to changing tack and t- trying different approaches. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard work. It's been hard work. There's and there's elements of, of luck in there. There's elements of good fortune and and elements of good good planning, good business. Mm. But and just as it was in sport, you know, some, sometimes you won not because you rode brilliantly, but because the wind was in your favour. Yeah, and somebody else is not favour. So there is always luck. There is always um, you know consistent performance. Um, and then, and then, just making sure that you're 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 doing the best that you can. Yeah. And it's it's you know we had some very difficult times at UW. Yes. To 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 where you needed all of that, you were back on the bottom rung of the ladder, thinking, mm. God, is this is this um, <laughs> is this it? Mm. And there will be those times again in the future. You know mm. that 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 is business. Mm. And 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 you've got to have a resilient and strong attitude to go. Well, I'm, I I can see through this. Um, we had a setback. We've lost our race. Mm. Right, let's re- regroup and go for the next one. Mm. And so UW have come through the energy crisis, help people save money, but also it's quite a unique business model. So there's lots of partners who do UW alongside jobs and stuff as a side gig. And you're seeing people who are having to be resilient all the time, having to put time in when it would be easier to you know, watch Netflix or sit with the family. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I've always found a huge number of sort of analogies between between. Um, in fact, I think most most of the people who've worked with me long enough are pretty bored of any of my rowing analogies because I, <laughs> because I always keep talking about them. But you know, the 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 one thing I think that that's interesting about what what um, that, that really gets me excited has always got me excited about UW it is this this self employed. Um, Community of partners who mm. who who can who, for whom we provide the rails for on which they can if they choose um, pursue their, their their goals. So we are sort of the enabler of lots of people to be able mm. to try and achieve something in their lives that perhaps they hadn't thought they could achieve, and and that's um, much more motivating, exciting to me than energy regulation or or, or telecoms or mobile <laughs> or insurance or any of that kind of stuff. It, it's the, the business has at its heart a, a sort of dynamic that is that is that is really sort of interesting gets gets me motivated. Mm. Um, within that opportunity, I, you know, I say it, it goes back to the for our partners. They can choose whether they want to have a crack at it and really commit to it, or they don't. And our um, to, to to be sort of it's not quite um, poach turn gamekeeper, but to be sort of sportsman. With that same kind of opportunity to then try and to enable other people to achieve that is is mm. been quite a sort of logical evolution, mm. um, and I think quite rare in business. Mm. You know, most businesses are about the hard numbers and the facts, whereas this is uh, much more about creating an environment and a psychology mm. for for thousands of people to try and achieve their goals, um, not as employees, but but as independent people who you encourage to mm. perform. Mm rather than crack the whip and say you must hit this target mm. that that doesn't exist in this business. So it's yeah. a it's a really interesting psychological um, challenge. In many ways it's a bit like being a coach. Mm. Rather than you know, you're not a um you're not a boss of these people. You're you're a coach trying to encourage them to perform better. Yeah. So whether it's rowers, aspiring sports people, UW people, people in business, people in a job people who've got through lockdown and not sure how, what would you say to people about keeping resilient and, you know, just keeping focused, however bad things might seem right now? Well, I think I think the, the overarching sort of feel of the times that I feel is that, is that, is that we're just having negativity thrown us from every corner. Yeah. And that wasn't something that, that, that was happening back when I was rowing. Um, it's emerged in the last, I don't know, five years. Everything's just negative, and yeah. everyone wants you to be miserable. Yeah. 
and you've just got to you've got to shed that completely and mm. let that roll off your back like you know like the proverbial water of the duck's back and not get sucked into it because it's it's not constructive and it's not in any way helping you achieve mm. your goals and it doesn't matter whether your goal is a is a sporting goal or a you know a walking goal or a whatever whatever a goal is and mm. and the goal can be lofty or very very near you know i want to be happy this afternoon mm. that's a goal mm. um the, 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 n- n- news and media is not going to help you achieve your goals mm. at all, ever, mm. in, in, in the current sort of dynamic. So the, the, there is a more and more calling for, for the bullshit filters, to yeah. filter out the stuff that is just not helping you in any way, shape or form. And, and it was literally a psychological tool, it sounds very technical, doesn't it, yeah. right? that we used back when I was rowing. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's so true today. Does it help you achieve your goal in any way to know that something has happened in some far-flung part of the world that you've never heard of, but is turned into a drama by the mm. media? No. Mm. So, so don't let it get in the way of you achieving your goal. Mm. Um, you know, we, we're people find people are under pressure, mm. whether as you know, the pandemic, case mm. in point. You know the. the, the that's got in the way of a lot of people's lives. Mm. But actually, if you can step back and go, well, what am I? What do I want to achieve? How do I go about that? The first question is, what do I stop consuming, which is holding me back? Mm. And then I think you'll get back to where you were before the pandemic, before the media became negative, before everything else, and you can start seeing your goals again. But you've got to have the belief that you want to actually achieve it. You've got, yeah. you've got to want to set a goal and yes. actually say, I do want to achieve this. But again, it goes back to the hard work and perseverance. If you want to shed 20 kilos, you can't do that tomorrow, mm. but you can start on the journey towards that. Mm. And you know, whether that's in, whether that's from my experience of business or whether it's from my experience of sport, it's, it's you know, taking bite-sized chunks towards your elephantine goal, yes. little bite, little bite, little bite, little bite, and then before you know it, oh, you've made some progress. Yes. And then you see that progress, and you, and you take, take heart from that and go, right, I've made some progress, I can do more. Yeah. Um, rather than going, I've made this much progress, but I've still got all that to do, I can never get there. No, you've made progress. Focus yeah. on what you have done um, and, and, and take heart. Mm-hmm. And vict- the margins of victory are often very, very thin. And so it's easy to think you're not going to achieve. Like, wasn't it with the Olympics, you were like, was it 0.5? Four or five seconds or something ridiculous. It was, it, 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 roughly, it actually, point eight of a second. So, so it was it was very very small. Yeah. Um, because most goals aren't as 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 uh, sort of binary as that. You mm. win or you lose. Most goals are an achievement. You, yes. you, so I don't think that. It, but 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 you can't jump to success. You mm. can't jump to achievement. You have to work your way there. Mm. And and I think if you're if I had gone aged 15 after my first race after watching the Olympics and going, I want to go to the Olympics and I want to be that good now. Mm. And I'd had some time to measure. I'd have been one millimetre along mm. with 100 metres still to go. And I could have looked at 100 metres and gone, I can't do this. Or you look at the millimetre of progress you've made and you go, well, I'm a millimetre closer to that goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and as long as you, you accept the how, that it's going to take time, mm. But you persevere, you keep going at it, and you just mm. don't let negative influences distract you, whether that girlfriend is trying to leave you or whether it's, you know, whatever it is, mm. lost races, bad results, the media, whatever it is that, you, that that's going to offset you. Just be true to your mm. goal. Mm. Stick a picture of whatever you're trying to do on the back of your door. Yeah. And every time you go out, remind yourself that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. And just keep working towards it and take a little action every day. And suddenly, miraculously, over time, you'll start find yourself getting that direction. I'm guessing that you don't spend a lot of time scrolling the news and social media. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm lives. not on social media at all. Yeah. Um, I don't see why I would be. I don't see what, I don't see what value it would bring to me. I might have some more friends or <laughs> friends. Um, but but I, don't, I don't like social media. Um, and news is an interesting one because I feel I need to be aware of what's going on for my, for my, to perform my career. And it's, and, and I myself, hands up, get distracted off into yeah. reading about something, and you suddenly realise I've just wasted twenty minutes doing something that I don't care about yeah, at yeah. all. And so you, you're, um, 
you've got to be very, very disciplined. But mm. discipline and focus. Last couple of things then. Uh, you had a mantra, didn't you, about today's going to be a, a great, it was pretty simple, man, yep. about today being a great day. Yeah, today's going to be a good day because we're going to make it a good day. Mm. And, and that was very closely related. That was a, a, a rowing uh, mm. in, in our Olympic crew. That was very close to the control the controllables, mm. the bullshit filters. It's mm. all about um, what can I do to influence how today goes? Focus on that. Mm. What can I not influence about what's going to happen today? The weather, the traffic, the other people on the road, on mm. the river, the, the competition, how they're training in America today. Mm. Can't control any of that stuff. Mm. So ignore it all. Totally dispel that from your life and focus on things that you can control mm. um, and, and make today a success. Mm. And actually, it's a really, really applicable mantra to life. Mm. It isn't just about the sport. It's, it's about, you know, we can all lose our direction because somebody says something to us that something happens that, that you know and the whole day is kiboshed because of that yeah and you realize you haven't achieved what you wanted to achieve yeah. and that's just that's a lack of discipline yeah. the discipline can i control this no i can't right move on mm -hmm. and so to someone who's listening right now who's not feeling great and thinking about giving up on whatever what would you say I think you've got to you've got to remember where do you where do you want to get to? In what 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 is it that's making you not feel great? Is it can, can you identify what what is what is holding you back at the moment and, and weighing you down, and also what it is that you would like to achieve, and where you'd like to get to, um, where you think that you would resolve whatever the, that is weighing you down, and then and then working out within that going on this control the controllables, what can you proactively do towards shedding the things that are weighing you down? Mm -hmm. um, if it's an environmental thing that you can't con control, then then accept that you can't, don't fight that. Mm -hmm. You can't, if it's raining every day on you, you can't do anything about that. You can get an umbrella, but <laughs> you can't do anything about that. You just got to accept that it's going to rain, yeah. but you want to get to the sunlit uplands over there. Um, then start walking in that direction. And yes, mm. it's going to carry on raining on you, but you're going to start getting closer to that sunlit mm. upland you're trying to mm. get to. Mm. But you've got to, there's no point in raging about the rain, and there's no point in sitting there in, un, unactive. Mm. You've got to take action towards what you want to do, and you've got to ignore the things that are holding you, that, that, mm. that are sort of mm. making you sad at the moment. So it, it, but, but you've got to have the perspective, you've got to get out of the hole and try and go right. What are the things here that are that are at play? Mm. And and once you, I, I would always write them down. Once you've written them down, you can then start to say right. Well, and what am I going to do about that one? Mm. Well, I can't do anything about that. So therefore, just accept it. Mm. What am I going to do about that one? I can do something about that. Right. And I'm not going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to start on the journey of doing that tomorrow. Mm. And I'm going to work towards being out of into the achieving my goal in months or years mm. not not days or minutes because you can't every anything that's worth achieving takes a lot of hard work mm. takes a lot of time but when you get there if, if you put the work yeah. and time in it will be worth it and finally what happened to the girlfriend she was in disgrace <laughs> and i went to came back to the olympics she rang me um and i didn't really want to speak to her but <laughs> luckily one of the joys of going to the olympics is that there are Lots of other people around that you can have to make friends with. Yes, suddenly you have more options. <laughs> so she, um, I haven't seen her since the Olympics. Um, but she did have the call to ring me when I got back to the UK and suggest meeting up, which was um, probably reinforced my perspective. On yeah, <laughs> an unwelcome call. <laughs> an unwelcome call. And, and, um, but again, it's interesting, your... your your resilience when you're in a place of confidence is so high, you go, I don't want to speak to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That call six months previously, when I'd been in the low point saying, yeah. should we meet up? I'd yeah. have been, yeah, 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 please, please, <laughs> please, please, please. Because it's all about your mindset. It's yeah. all about where you are and how confident you are. When you're down, you're vulnerable. Yeah. When you're up, you're strong. Mm -hmm. And and if you can be strong when you're down, and I would actually also say, be vulnerable when you're up. Yeah. If you can turn those round, 
that's a huge thing to be, to be humble when you're succeeding, everything's going well, and to be strong when things are going badly, which is exactly the opposite of what your body and your mental state will try and be. Mm. You'll try and be weak when you're down, and you'll try and be strong when you're up. Yes. Actually, it's, it, turn those around, and you'll be a much better person. Great advice to end on. In this coldest studio <laughs> ever. <laughs> is it not? Definitely, definitely. right. I, I, I find it a very warming conversation. Oh, right? well, it's been war- that's, that's warmed me. <laughs> but it has been freezing. But Andrew, Lindsay, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, appreciate all your insights. Not at all. Very good to talk. I hope there was something worthwhile. Definitely. Thanks for listening to The Resilience Project. Make sure you're subscribed for notifications with your favourite podcast platform so you find out first when the next one is released. For other news and updates, you can register with me directly at weslinden.com forward slash podcast. <laughs>